If you would, do me a favor and just go ahead and open your Bibles up to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, uh, if, this is, if this passage of Scripture is not underlined in your Bible or circled, if you, if you do that, if you feel comfortable doing that, uh, I'm going to ask you to do that today. This is one I want you to continue to go back to, to look at, to study, to meditate on, to make it your prayer. Uh, it's Proverbs chapter 3. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, and this is what we're going to look at this morning as we begin this new series. The name of this series is In God We Trust. Some of you will recognize that as, as the motto, the, the national motto. Here in this country, we, we, we have declared that, hey, in God we trust, and it was declared back in 1956, President Eisenhower, he signed it into law. This will be our national motto. It is on our money. It'll be on a dollar, and you can pull out a dime. It'll be on your dime. Here in the state of Georgia, you can, you can see it on a lot of different license plates as people take that sticker and put there at the bottom of their license tag. In God we trust. The phrase came from a man by the name of Pollock nearly 100 years before it was signed into law. He was the Secretary of Treasury, and he thought it's a good idea if we go ahead and just, just automatically declare it and say it, put it on all of our, all of our currency, in God we trust. When it was signed into law, it wasn't very controversial at the time. And the reason it wasn't controversial at that time is because we were going through what is known as the Cold War. And what that would mean for our country is that we realized that there were enemies out there that were mighty, that were strong. And it wasn't controversial because we thought it's a good idea for us to declare that there is one who is stronger than even our enemies that are out there. They were living in a time of fear in 1956. We didn't know what was to come, and so we said, God, it's in you that we put our trust. However, as many of you know, it's one of the controversial statements of our time. Even here in this country, there are people who are bringing lawsuits saying, we need to take it off of our currency. We need to take it off of anything, the motto, make it not our motto, because that would be not the separation of church and state. In other words, we would say, you know what? We, we, we would rather live in a world or in a place where, where, where God has no influence over our government. We would la- we'd rather be living in a place where God becomes less significant to us. In our nation, it's one of those declarations now where we kind of say, you know what, maybe we've got things covered. Maybe we've got things handled. Maybe we've figured things out. Maybe we're really kind of in control here. God, maybe we don't need you so much. In God we trust. I really don't want to focus on our nation here this morning, even though I do believe that God is bringing us to a place and a time where he's calling us back to himself. And I do believe it's going to come through, well, maybe we could put it as a trial by fire, where eventually we'll begin to see again how desperately it is that we do need God and we do need to call out to him. But not talking about our nation so much, talking instead today about the individual, you and me personally. And I wonder if, if your personal statement or make it your personal motto, can you say, it's in God that I trust and mean it with your whole heart? It's in God that I trust. I trust every area of my life. It's in God that I trust my life. I trust my life to him. Are you able to say that? Some of you remember the song, um, and it kind of goes like this. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. Everybody now, in his hands. He's got, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, you know that song, right? Yeah, it's just kind of this. He's got the whole world, and he's got things in control. He's got, uh, well, well, I want you to do something with me this morning. Go ahead and take your hands like that. Put your pens down for a quick second. And I want you to picture your world in your hands right now. What would you put here, okay, and call it your world? Uh, for some of us, we would go, wow, a big part of my world, it, it's, it's my kids, okay? I, I love my kids, and I, I worry about my kids. I always think about my kids. I try to prepare and plan for my kids. And so a big part of my world are my kids, okay? And so that's part of your world. Others of you, you would say, well, in my world, it's my marriage. Um, that is my world right now, and I want to have a good marriage, a strong marriage. Or, uh, and so my marriage is, is really kind of my world. Uh, or maybe it's my job. 
you know, my world is my job, man. It, it occupies all my time and everything that I do, and I really want to do a good job at my job, and so my world is my job. And just kind of think about what, what would be your world right here, okay? And all the different elements, all the different parts of it. Now, as you consider all that is here in your world, I want to ask now, what will you do with that? What will you do with this right here? Are you at the point or at the place in your life where you're able to say, you know what, I call this my world, but instead, God, I'm going to make it your world. I'm going to give it over to you. I'm going to trust you with every one of these items, every one of these areas in my life. Here you go. It's yours. Because that really is the action of trust. If I'm going to declare for myself, in God I trust, I have to take every part of my world and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. Here, it's yours. But too often, I find myself saying, you know what, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're really in, that much in control. Do you really have the whole world in your hands? Are you really, God, can I really trust you? Sometimes it can be difficult to trust, and the reason it's difficult to trust is we've come from relationships where we thought we could trust somebody, and then they failed us. Maybe you were in a relationship with a, with a boyfriend, maybe a girlfriend, or maybe it was a husband or a wife, and promises were made, and, and then suddenly you put all your trust there and realize that, well, they broke that trust, and as a result, I'm hurt, and, and they said this and instead did this, and, and so now we come with this but wait a second now, can I really trust even you, God? I've been at that place of hurt before. I've been at that place of, of being burned before. And just now, I mean, I look at my world and my, my instinct is to hold on tight and say, I've got the whole world, my world in my hands and I'm not going to let it go. I'm going to do everything I can to hold on to these, these, these pieces that are so very valuable and important to me. But instead... God says, hey, 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 why don't you give that to me? Why don't you give that to me? Why don't you trust me with that? And watch what I can do with all of those areas in your life. So the big question, the big question today really becomes, can I trust you, God? Can I really trust God? I believe that we can. And I'm gonna give you reasons for why we should trust God today. But before we do that, I want you to look at the promises that are given to us in Scripture of when we trust God. And it's found right here in Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 5. It says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own, but listen for God's voice in everything that you do and everywhere that you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Instead, run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health and your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything that you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. I want you to notice as what, in what we just read that, that through each of these verses, there's what we call the premise and the promise. And I, I realize this, some of your translations read different than what I just read right here, but, but it's all saying the same thing. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and, and here's the promise. He'll guide, he'll direct, he'll lead you, he'll direct your paths. And then it says, don't be wise in your own eyes, the premise. And I think sometimes we get way too wise in our own eyes. Don't get wise in your own eyes. Don't think that you've got it all figured out. Don't think that you, you, you know so much that you, you just, instead, don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. Depart from evil. He says that, that will bring health to your body, strength to your bones. And then he says, honor God with, with everything in your life with the first fruits, with just, just give honor to God. And what you're going to find is God will cause your barns to be full, your wine vats to overflow. God brings this abundance into your life more than you can handle. And we come down to the question, but can I really trust God? Can I really trust God? I mean, is he trustworthy? 
I believe he is. And I've seen him faithful in my life. I've seen him faithful in so many of your lives. But still today, we all come to that place where he says here, take all this, take all this and hand it over to me. Trust me. I'm going to give you five reasons why I believe we can trust God today. Five reasons. And these reasons I want to be for you and I to to take hold of in this relationship with God where we're going through the tough times and we're going through the ups and the downs where we say, you know what, I can still hold on tight to him. The first reason I want you to write down this morning as to why we can trust God is simply this. Write this down. I can trust God because his love is undeniable. I can trust God because his love is undeniable. It says in John chapter 3, verse 16, and this is how much that God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Do you realize how much God loves you? Have you realized what he's willing, did what he did for you in giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die there on the cross so that you and I can live? It's an incredible, incredible picture of the love that God has for you and me. Several months ago, Kim and I are standing in our kitchen and uh, I get this text. And it was from my son, Chase. We had been, uh, we'd been uh, I, think, I think God was kind of speaking to us and saying, hey, maybe you need to contact him. Maybe you need to figure out if everything's okay with him. Some of you know he went off to school and uh, a good bit of, a little ways away from us. But, but we get this text and he's texting me and he's saying um, that he was on his way with some friends to pick up another friend at the Atlanta airport. And, uh, and so I'm just kind of reading through these texts, finding out where he is, what he's doing. And then he happens to say that they got a flat tire in downtown Atlanta. And so they get this flat tire in downtown Atlanta. We're getting a little bit worried. and Everything okay? And he says, we got off at the first exit that they could find, and they found a gas station, and uh, they were hoping to be able to change the tire. All these texts are coming through. And so as we're t- Kim and I are talking, what in the world? I hope they're going to be okay. Are they going to be able to change the tire? Hope everything's all right. We're here. And, and then the next thing is I get a, I get a text from my son saying, oh my goodness, we just got robbed. And so immediately I'm on the phone, I'm calling Chase, trying to figure out what's going on. And I get him on the phone and I can just kind of hear it in his voice. He's saying, dad, you're not gonna believe this. Uh, we, we did, we, uh, we got a flat tire on our way uh, to the airport. We pulled off at this one gas station and uh, he told me where it was. And just from telling me where it was, I realized that he was in one of the worst sections of Atlanta that you could possibly be in. And he said, and and we got this flat tire. We pulled into this gas station and a a group of guys come up to us and said, hey, we'll help you guys change your tire. Instead of changing their tire, they robbed them. And and I say, Chase, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I said, call the police. I'm on my way. I went out and I hopped into my truck and I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, I made it from exit 222 to downtown Atlanta faster than anybody ever has, okay? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm punching it, and I'm driving, 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 check for cops, driving, 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 check for cops, driving, 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 check for cops, you know? I was like, I got to get there. I couldn't get there fast enough. I was racing to them as fast as I can, and finally, I hit the exit, get off the exit. I, I, I go down the little road where I know the gas station's at, and I hit that. I, I pull up in the gas station. There, there are cops everywhere. Lights are flashing. There's crowds of people all around trying to see what's going on. And, I mean, I felt like I was on an episode of Cops, you know? And, uh, and so I pull into the gas station. I jump out of the truck. I barely had time to jump out of the truck when suddenly this big redhead kid comes running to me and, and, and almost tackles me, embracing me. And I thought, what a picture. What a picture of what your God has done for you. No matter where it is you are, no matter what condition you're in, you have the God of the universe who says, I am stepping down out of heaven. Nothing's going to get in my way. 
and I'm coming to you. I'm coming to save you because I love you like you can't even imagine. I love you so much, I would rather die than live without you. And that's exactly what he did. Can you trust God? I, I know some of you might, might still wrestle with that question in your mind. Can I really trust God? Who is God and what is God all about? And what you need to know, what you need to understand is God loves you so much. He came to die in your place on the cross. And all you have to do is just fall into his saving arms, his embrace. And I ask that some of you will do that right now. Right now. If, if you don't hear another word that I say today, that's great. That's fine. But get this. Right here, right now, quietly in your own mind, you can talk with God. You can call out to him and say something like this. Say, God, I need you. I need you. I can't, I can't make it on my own. I can't save myself, but I am asking you to forgive me of my sin and come and live inside of me and be my God, my Savior, my friend for all of eternity. And that is you falling into his arms. And the Bible says that he saves you you're his, he's yours for all of eternity. And that's the best decision you could ever make. Please, please do that here now in this moment if you've never done that before. But that's the message that you have a father that loves you that much. His love is undeniable. And because he loves you that much, you can trust him. Second reason I want you to write down here this morning, number two. I can trust God not only because his love is undeniable, but number two, because his power is incomparable. There is none mightier, none stronger. His power is incomparable. Jeremiah 10, verse 6, here's what it says. Lord, there is no one like you, for you are great and your name is full of power. You've got it. You've got it. You're strong. You're mighty. There is nobody as strong as you got. I think um, one of the reasons that God gives some of us dads, daughters is for our egos. Um, what I mean by that is uh, uh, my, my daughter, Madison, when, uh, when she was young, she would, uh, she'd come sit on my lap and and uh, I'd have my arm around her. And, and then every once in a while, she would go, um, hey, Dad, let me see your muscle. And I said, baby, you want to see my muscle? Okay. I'll, I'll try to, I can't even get up over this muscle right here, guys. <laughs> and then I, I'd, I'd make a muscle for her. And she'd feel that muscle. She'd go, oh, Daddy, you're so strong. Uh, yeah, I know, baby. And it was just kind of this, oh, wow, you know, just my dad is so strong. And now it's weird because now she's gotten older. I think she kind of looks around and realizes, you're not as strong as I thought he was, you know, before. But, but that's okay. That's okay. But, but here's the deal. I think, I think we have a heavenly father who delights in us coming to him going, daddy, you are so strong. You are so strong. You're so strong that you, you've got this. You've, you've got this. This situation that, that is completely out of control for me, that I can't fix, that I can't handle, that you got this, you're strong enough, you're greater than. Everything obeys you. The sun, the moon, the stars, the weather, the wind, the rain, it all obeys you. Sometimes we look at people and we think these people, the government's in control, but you're the one who's really in control and you can move them at your will. You're in control. You've got this. You've got this. Just uh, 
this last week, um, I'm standing in the kitchen and talking to Kim and, and she kind of knows, uh, she, she kind of sensed it from me and I'm just, I'm just there whining and complaining, uh, just frustrated and aggravated and irritable and upset and, and stressed out. This one thing that, that we've been trying, I've been trying to deal with and, and, and handle for, for several months now. And it's just, it's just driving me absolutely nuts. And it's just making me mad and upset. And I, I'm, I'm just upset about this thing. And I'm kind of just in there and I'm whining and complaining about it and going on and on. And, uh, and she asked me, she asked me this question. She goes, okay, is there anything else that you have not done that you could do? And I said, uh, no, I've done everything. I've done everything that I need to do. I've done everything exactly as I need to do it. I've done, I've done all that I can do. She's saying, you're, so there's, you've done everything that you possibly could do, and there's nothing more that you can do. I've done everything that I possibly could do. There's nothing really more than I, that I can do. She goes, perhaps this is just one of those areas that maybe now we should trust God with. And I thought to myself, I'm the preacher here. Why don't you just be quiet? You know, so. <laughs> I didn't say that. But I said, you know what? You're right. You're right. I mean, I've done everything. I've done my part and everything that I possibly can do. And instead now I whine and complain and I stress about it and I worry about it rather than simply say, here you go. Here you go. God, you've got this. I know you've got this. You're mightier than this. You're stronger than that. Isn't it awesome to be able to, to, to sometimes have our eyes open up and to be able to see how the God is working in the world all around us and see his might and his power and just kind of, it's like watching God flex every once in a while, you know, and just going, wow, how cool is that? My God is greater. We were, we were at a pastor's conference this last week, me and several of the pastors here. Uh, from the church, and, and uh, pa I say pastors as pastors and business leaders, and uh, we gathered in this big ballroom at the Fox uh, downtown Atlanta, and uh, one of the cool things, we sat around these tables, and we listened to different speakers, and, and one of the guys who got up and spoke, um, in fact, he has a connection with us, um, he runs the organization that we have partnered with, some of you are very familiar with this, uh, you, you know, when you come through those main doors there in the atrium and you see all those those boards along the wall and you see the verses up there and people have written their names and, and that is us partnering with this group of people who translates and, and we sign up and translate the book of Luke into a language of people uh, in Brazil who have never had the Bible in their own language. And so we're a part of that and hopefully this Christmas we're going to be able to give them the book of Luke as, a, as an incredible Christmas gift to, to this group of people. But uh, this, this man who was speaking, he's the one who kind of leads and heads up that organization. And he was talking to us about, about translating uh, in, in the Chinese, uh, uh, one of the Chinese languages, the Bible into that language for the, another group of people there in China. And so they got the Bibles all put together and then they were taking them to deliver to these people there in China. And, and they fly in and they have to go through customs and this is the scariest part for them because uh, they're, they're basically smuggling these things in and, and if they get caught, they could be in really a lot of trouble. And so they have all these Bibles, they're packed in these bags and satchels that they, their team is walking, walking through customs with. And he says, things are going great. Everybody gets through without even having to have their bags checked or looked through at all, except one man on their team. And this one man had the largest satchel with the most Bibles stuffed into it. And he gets ready, he's going through uh, the, the little thing that beeps as you're walking through. And, but, but right when he's about to go through that, the guy, the guard holds up his hand and goes, no, no, you, and points where he needs to go and put his bag through one of those scanning devices. He puts it on the conveyor belt and everybody's just like, this is it, this is it. They're gonna see what we're doing. Uh, this is bad. Uh, it, they're not only not gonna get the Bibles, but there's no telling what they'll do to us as they see that we're smuggling these Bibles in. And so everybody just panics and, and they're, just, they're just praying, calling out to God in their minds, God, you've got to do something here. This is a terrible, terrible situation. And, and they watch as his bag begins to move down the conveyor belt and starts to go into the machine that's scanning it. And there's a man over there and he's sitting, watching the screen, looking at everything that's being scanned as it's going through. And he said, there they're praying and the bag starts to go through. And he goes, just as the bag enters into the scanning machine, the guy on the computer looking at the screen 
suddenly glances up, and there's this breezeway. And walking along the breezeway is a young Chinese girl in a black leather miniskirt. <laughs> and he said they literally watched the bag move like this and the guy's eyes move like this. <laughs> Never once did he look at the screen. And the bag got through and they grabbed his bag and they walked out and everybody just started celebrating. <laughs> Our God is awesome. How powerful a God who can speak into existence a young Chinese girl in a black litter miniskirt at just the right time, huh? That's the kind of God we have. He's able. He's all-powerful. He's strong enough to handle even that thing that's stressing you out today, that's on your mind right now. He can handle it. He can handle it. That's the second reason to trust him, but what is the third? The third, I want you to write this down. Not only is his love undeniable or his power is incomparable, but number three, his promises are unbreakable. His promises are unbreakable. I like the way it's put right here. Psalms 1830, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. God's promises prove true. Now, let me just ask, raise your hand to this. How many of you have ever had somebody in your life make you a promise and then break it? Mm -hmm. How about this? How many of you have ever made a promise and then broken it? Yeah. Now, I know even as you're raising your hand right there, you're thinking, yeah, I, you know, I, I did, I made this promise, and I didn't want to break it, but I still managed to break it anyway because, well, things were out of my control. There are some things you just can't, well, that's the point. That's the point. Here's what I mean by that. Suppose, um, suppose you came up to me today and say, hey, Bo, how about you and I go out to eat, eat lunch together? And I said, great, let's do. And, uh, and you said, let's go eat at Carrabba's and Morrow. Okay, we'll go eat at Carrabba's and Morrow, and we'll do it on Monday at 12 o'clock. Deal, deal. And I say to you, all right, I'm going to go, and I'll be there at Carrabba's um, at 12 o'clock, but you need to promise to me that, that you will be there at 12 o'clock. And you go, I promise you, I will be there. I will meet you at Carabas at 12 o'clock. And so I, I get up there and I sit down and, 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 and you're not there. 12 o'clock comes, 12 o'clock goes, you're not there. 12.15, you're still not there. And I'm going, wow, they broke their promise to me. But you, you, if we could see you at that moment, well, you were getting on the highway and you got on the ramp going north on I-75 and there's never any traffic there. But you ran into traffic, and there you are sitting in the middle of traffic, and you're going, I'm breaking my promise. And I would understand, well, that's out of your control, right? But you see, when we talk about God, traffic's not a problem. When we talk about somebody who's all-powerful, who, 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 who put the sun and the moon, the stars in their orbit... Who, who, who speaks and makes things, none of that is out of his control, which is why we can say his promises can never be broken because God is above all that. And he says, try me, try me. Check out my, check out my promises, test me, go see. And they all prove true, everyone. His promises are unbreakable. His power is incomparable. His love for you is undeniable, but then write this down. Number four, his presence is inescapable. His presence is inescapable. Psalms 139, verse seven through 10, it says, I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Or, or maybe we kind of put it this way. Where can I go to get away from you, from, from your presence? I can't, get, I can't go anywhere. Even on my highs, even on my lows, you're still there. 
If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. God's there. And he never leaves you. His promise is that he will never forsake you. He's there. He's there. And I know it's one of those things where sometimes we kind of live as if, well, things are going really good, man. Everything's clicking for me. Everything's working out just right. God, you are just, you're right here beside me, man, every step of the way. But then something goes bad. <laughs> Where are all my friends? I used to have friends, and I don't have friends anymore, and I feel so lonely. Where are you, God? God, where are you? Or in this depression where I, I just feel exhausted, and I'm so tired, I don't even want to get out of bed in the morning, and I just, I'm in this real low, God, where are you? You've disappeared. You've disappeared. Or just things have fallen through. And we were working on this relationship, and they were really good, and we were together. I was, I mean, God, you're there, but man, it's all, it's all no good anymore. And, 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 and look where, God, what, why did you disappear on me? Where are you? Or I've worked really hard, and I've tried to handle the situation, and I'm just, all I'm doing is trying to provide for my family and, and do the best that I can here. And it's like, it's like you've just disappeared on me. God, where are you? You ever feel like that? How many of you have ever, have, have any of you, have, you ever play peekaboo with a baby? You ever do that? If you haven't, it's fun, right? I mean, try it sometime. And you know how it kind of goes. You, there, a little baby laying right there, and you get down in their face, and, and, uh, and you put your hands over your, over your face like this. And uh, when you put your hands over your face, you're kind of peeking through, and you can see the baby go, <laughs> where'd they go? They were just there. And what do you do? Peek a boom. They're like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> There you are. Where'd you come from? Right? Yeah. And I, 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 think in, I think in the same way. One day our eyes are going to be opened. One day we're going to see, I, I, th I thought you disappeared on me, but you were right there all along. When, 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 I, when I was going through that hurt and that sorrow and that pain, you knew my pain. You were walking, you were right there with me every step of the way. And now I see, and now I see you. His presence, there's nowhere that you can go to get away from his presence. He is right there with you every step of the way. That's a promise of his. That you can hold on, that you can hold on to. Yeah, there's one more I want you to write down. Real quick, number five, his people are unshakable. What a great promise. His people are unshakable. Psalms 125, verse 1. Here it is. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever those who trust in the Lord. His people are unshakable. And it's one of those things where we put our trust in a lot of different places, a lot of different things, don't we? And you've been there and you've tried that before. You'll have your trust in this and only to see that it falls apart. Or you'll put your trust over here only to see that it fails. At the beginning of the season, I was talking with the guys, Taylor up here, he, he starts saying, hey, man, this is the year. And I'm like, yeah, man, this is the year. This is the year. I mean, think about it. We've got Tony Gonzalez. He came back. Roddy White, man, the guy's just magical out there catching. Uh, there's Julio. Julio just doesn't miss. We got all these guys. We got the team. This is the year of the Falcons. And we were all like, yeah, man, they're going to be number one. They're going to be number one. And, and just a few Weeks later, <laughs> our chance of they're going to be number one turned to they're going to be number uh, 10, 15, I don't know. And you're going, we put our trust there, and it falls apart. Or how about this? We put our trust in the stock market because that's, that's where things are secure. 
when we put our trust in our government because they've got it all figured out. <laughs> and we have to say, where do we put our trust? And God says, wait, 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 wait. How about with me? How about with me? Are you ready? Are you willing? You tried all these others. How about now with me? I heard a story, um, and uh, it was, uh, it, it was this, of, of this blind beggar. He, he lived uh, centuries ago in India. And, and, and every day his life consisted of sitting alongside this road where, where, where people would walk by. And uh, he would sit there with his tin cup and his bowl his bowl of rice. You see, he would sit there and, and, and he would call out for people to, to have mercy, to give alms to the poor and people would come by and drop a few coins in and he would take the little bit of money that he received to go buy some more rice so that he could live another day. He would sit there and, and beg and eat his rice and beg and eat his rice and beg and eat his rice. But one day, he thought, my luck is changing. One day, he heard that the prince was going to be coming by the very spot that he would beg at day after day after day. And he had heard about this prince, that he was, he was a man who was gracious, a man who was kind to beggars such as himself. He thought, my luck is about to change because surely he's going to come by and he's going to see me in this condition and he's going to help. He got even more excited as he's sitting there. And in the distance, he can hear the ringing of the bells on the caravan as it's coming his way. As they get closer, he can hear the footsteps of the horse, horses. His heart starts to beat fast. He starts to call out, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. Will you help a blind man? And that's when suddenly the caravan he could tell, stop right in front of him. He heard shuffling around and somebody getting off of their horse and coming over and standing right in front of him. And he knew this must be the prince. This is my chance. But suddenly he heard the voice of the prince and the prince said something he wasn't expecting. As the man called out alms for the poor, the prince said, Hey, beggar, give me your rice. He, he didn't know what to do with that. Why, why, why would a prince with everything that he's got want my rice from me? Doesn't he know? This is all, but, but prince, this is all I've got. This is, this is, the only, this is it. This is, this is all, this is, I just sit here and eat my rice. Don't take my rice. And the prince said, give me your rice. The beggar reached into his bowl of rice and took out one grain and lifted his hand up to drop it into the hand of the prince. He said, this is, this is all I can spare. You can have this. But still, the prince said, beggar, give me your rice. Give me all your rice. Sir, why, why do you want my rice? You don't need my rice. This is all I have. Um, here, here's one more piece. He gave him one more grain of rice. But again, the prince said, beggar, give me all of your rice. I thought you were kind. I thought you were nice. I've heard about you. Why are you asking me for my rice? How dare you? Beggar, give me your rice. Finally, he takes one more piece and says, that's it. That's all I can, one, one more grain, that's all I can spare. I've got to keep this for myself or I'm going to die. And with that, he took his hand and covered up his bowl. And he heard some shuffling around. He heard what he thought was a bag of gold. And then he heard clanking in his cup. In his cup, the prince dropped one, two, 
three pieces of gold. The beggar said, sir, you can have all my rice. <laughs> but by then it was too late. And he heard the prince get back on his horse and ride away. Leaving the beggar to wonder, oh, if only I had trusted him with everything. Your world, what will you do with it? Your kids, your marriage, your finances, your time, your health. When the prince says, will you give it to me? The question is, can I trust him? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Can you trust God? God, you know that it is a struggle sometimes. We try to handle things. We try to fix things. We try to control things only to realize that our best efforts always seem to fall short. But teach us to trust in you. You've shown us from your word, from your scripture, what an amazing God you are, one who loves us beyond measure, one who is all-powerful, all-knowing. There's nowhere we can go to escape from your presence. You're right here with us every step of the way. Your promise is that we will not be shaken if we trust you. Father, I pray that every single one of us here today will simply hold up our own little worlds and say, you've got this. I trust you with everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.